the Savior himself will say to us, strive to enter by the narrow gate and you will take my warnings glibly to your own eternal peril. So Jesus preached, he taught about a place of torment reserved for the devil and his angels and all those who follow them. And this is a place of everlasting torment. Jesus would refer to it in Matthew 25, verse 40, 41, when he says, Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire. Or John the baptizer, Matthew 3 and verse 12 Speaking of Jesus, will say his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff or the rebels, the unrepentant, the unbelieving ones, the chaff, he will burn with unquenchable fire, unquenchable fire, never able to be quenched. In addition to the e eternality or the everlasting nature of this, Jesus also taught about a place that was not only everlasting, but was intense, intense in its torment. He would speak in Luke 16 and verse 24 of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And in that parable, we of course remember the rich man's words as he says, could Abraham just dip a finger in water and touch my tongue? For that is the degree of torment in which I find myself, just a finger dipped in water touching me would bring me such relief. Or he speaks in Matthew 8 and verse 12 of a similar thing, outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Look with me in Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11. We read the fuller passage before the service began. He also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured forth full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here we see the eternality of the punishment. We see the intensity of the punishment described as the smoke of, of their torment going up day and night with no rest. Places of outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Revelation describes it as a lake of fire. So we often ask the question, does this mean that hell is a place of literal fire? Is it literally a lake of fire? And I don't know the answer to that, though I suspect the answer is no. I suspect it's not a literal place of fire. But here's the thing to understand well. When we speak about biblical symbolism, biblical metaphors and biblical symbolism, shadows that point to the greater reality, in every case of biblical symbolism, every single one, the reality that the symbolism points to is more intense than the symbol that points to it. There's not a single exception to that. Every time symbolic language is used in the Scripture, the reality that it points to is worse or more intense, or if it's a godly reality, better. In whatever case, it's more intense than the symbol itself. R.C. Sproul, when he pre preaches this passage, he says that if we could go to hell, to this lake of fire, and offer those who are there to go from where they are to a literal lake of fire, that they would jump at the opportunity because that would be a great improvement to where they are. So whether this is a literal place of flames or not, the imagery is clear. It's a place of great, great eternal torment. We have this image, I think, of hell that I was taught as a kid. I sort of grew up in a church environment in which this image of hell... Remember I said it was preached on once every month or every other month. But this image of hell was this, this place that I was taught 
and which is full of people who have been condemned to hell and they spend eternity saying to themselves, if I just had one more chance, if I just had one more chance, I would repent, I would believe, I'd get out of this place. That's not biblical at all. That's not a biblical picture of hell at all. Instead, hell is described as a place of great gnashing of teeth. That means anger. Paul Washer puts it this way. He said, if God were to go to hell and stand in the doorway and say to those souls who are there, acknowledge me and leave this place, they would slam the door in his face and say, we hate you now more than ever. It's a place of never-ending anger, never-resolving bitterness, hatred, like nothing that this life can describe. Torment, like nothing on earth can describe. One of the ways in which we misspeak as Christians is if you, I've said this, probably everyone in the room has said this, if you've ever used a phrase in such a way as to say, blank is hell. This root canal is hell. Oh, this class that I'm going through is just hell. With all due respect, if you say that and believe it, you don't have a clue of what hell is. It is a place in which words cannot begin to describe the eternal, everlasting torment of the place. It is a place that if you have the slightest inkling of the reality of this place, you would not wish upon your worst, most bitter enemy to go there for even 20 seconds. That's the place that Jesus is speaking of. And notice with me who he speaks it to. He's not talking to Pharisees. He's talking to his people. And he threatens, if you will, his own people to say to them, your battle against sin is so important that in order to communicate to you the seriousness of this battle, I will threaten you with eternal damnation with eternal hell. Again, what happened to our polite, kind, loving, caring Jesus who never said harsh things, who was always just full of love and that's all He ever was? What happened to that Jesus? Answer, He never existed. Because the Jesus of the Gospels would use the most harsh words, the most harsh realities to warn His people that if their battle against sin faltered, this is what they should fear. So we're going to walk through in just a few minutes, I think perhaps a couple of things that will be helpful for us to understand that. But before we do that, let me just say two things that Jesus is not teaching because this is, I think, important to just make haste and say, here's what Jesus is not saying. Here's what the passage is not saying. The first thing the passage is not saying is it's not saying that the source of sin is in your body or that the source of sin is anything physical. Jesus is not saying if you just cut off your sinful hand, then you'll be holy. He can't be saying that because he would contradict his own words from just chapter 7, in which he himself said, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, etc. Jesus it would, would utterly contradict himself if what he was saying now is the solution to sin is just get rid of whatever body part was the body part that did the sinning. That's ludicrous. And so Jesus is not teaching that the source of sin is the actual body. Nor is Jesus teaching sanctification by dismemberment. That would be grotesque. 
Jesus is not teaching that holiness comes by dismembering or disfiguring one's body. This was something that took great root in the Middle Ages and the Roman Catholic Church still exists today in many forms of Roman Catholicism and other religions. This idea of cutting out the part of the body that engages in sinfulness. Particularly, this takes manifestation in the sin of lust. And there have been many, many people who have removed from their body the organ that would be used in acting out sexual lust, thinking that Jesus told them to do that. And in reality, many of those people who have done that, who have made themselves, un made themselves eunuchs, Jesus even mentioned such people, many of those who have made themselves eunuchs for the purpose of holiness would later go on to say, I struggle with lust just like I did before. So cutting off a hand is not going to make anyone any holier. You got another one. If you sin with the left hand and you cut that one off, you've got a right hand. How are you going to cut your right hand off? You're going to use your feet to cut your right hand off? If you cut off one foot, you still got another one. Gouge out one eye, you still have another. Take out both eyes, you still have memories of sinful things that you've seen. The source of sin is not the body, and holiness does not come by cutting out parts of the body. Jesus is not teaching that. What is Jesus teaching? I think that there are three ways in which it's helpful for us to apply this text for us. What Jesus is teaching is the necessity of the child of God to engage in radical warfare against temptation and the willingness for every child of God to remove from their life whatever is dear or near to you or pleasant to you, whatever, if it is the occasion of sin. So the first thing that we would see is Number one here in your notes, faithfulness requires both honesty and consistent reflection upon the reality of hell. So Jesus, as we said moments ago, speaking to his people, says to them, if there is some way in which you are sinning, remove that opportunity, lest you go to hell. Now, we would hear that and we would say, well, how in the world does that square with other places in Scripture? For example, John 10 and verse 28, in which Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. How does it square with that? How does it square with things like Romans 8 and verse 1? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How does it square with this? And here's the answer to that. There's one thing Scripture is never afraid of, and that's tension. Scripture is not afraid of having tension with itself. Scripture is not afraid of one reality and one truth being held in tension against another reality. And so there is the reality of the security of the true and genuine child of God. There's the reality of there is no condemnation for the child of God in Christ Jesus. There's a reality that salvation is the work of God. And when God brings that work of salvation upon a sinner, then they are his eternally. They're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Revelation teaches emphatically, emphatically, those who are sealed with the name of Christ, they will stand. But yet there is the other reality in which Jesus himself will say, strive to enter by the narrow door. That word strive is agonizomai, the word that we get our word agonize from. Agonize to enter through the narrow door. Furthermore, we are told things like, for example, Luke chapter 12 and verse 4 and verse 5. I tell you, my friends, by the way, Jesus is speaking to people here that he calls friends. Who did he call his friends? Those who were his sheep. By the way, I tell you, my friends or my sheep, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more than that they can do. But I warn you, my sheep, I warn you whom to fear. Fear him whom after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear him who has the authority to cast you into hell or to say it another way, fear being cast into hell. Speaking to my sheep. So that's held in tension against the reality that if you are in Christ, 
That is the salvation of God, and that cannot be overdone or undone by you. Yet, Jesus will say to his own people, listen, if there is an occasion to sin that keeps cropping up in your life, you better get rid of it because it's a whole lot better for you to go to heaven without that than to go to hell with it. And so Jesus is saying to his people here, listen, work it out however you want. Resolve your tension however you want. But what I think the scriptures are saying to us is hold that tension. Hold the tension between the security of the believer and the absolute necessity of the believer to fight tooth and nail for holiness, which the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 12 tells us, without that holiness, you will never see God. I think that's the reality that he's saying to us. Faithfulness requires both honesty about and consistent reflection upon the reality of hell. How long has it been since you reflected upon the reality of hell? How long has it been since you thought about eternal torment? And those thoughts drove you in prayer to say, Lord, save me from that. Deliver me from that. Show me what I must kill in my life to be delivered from that. That's number one. Number two is this. Every disciple pursuing Holiness at whatever the cost, whatever the cost, whatever is dear to you, whatever is close to you, whatever the cost, in pursuing that holiness, we must cultivate the habit of examining the patterns of our own sinfulness and seeking to discern the occasion of that sinfulness. And when we discern that, being willing to rid ourselves of whatever it is, is the repetitive occasion for sin in our life. We must value the life, the eternal life that Christ offers us to such an extent that we would say, I am willing to consistently examine myself and examine the ways in which I fall into sin. And when I see a pattern, whatever that pattern is attached to, I'm willing to get rid of it, no matter how close it is to me, no matter how dear it is to me, no matter how much I enjoy it, no matter what. And so some of us in our pursuit of holiness, I would assume some of us probably need to get rid of some laptops. Perhaps some smartphones should be in danger. So perhaps some should go down to the cell phone store and trade in a smartphone for the old flip phones. I don't know. Perhaps some of us need to really investigate our means of entertainment, of the things that we are entertained by, of the shows that we are entertained by. And if we are being entertained by the world's sin, tell me how this passage means anything if it doesn't mean get rid of that. Does it have any meaning if it doesn't at least mean that? Some of us need to examine the things that we laugh at. Some of of us might need to examine some friends in our life. And some of us might need to eliminate some friendships in our life. And you say, but I'm so close to them. They're so dear to me. I've been friends with them my whole life. Yes, they're a bad influence on me, but I've been friends my whole life with them. Are you closer to them than your left eye? Would you miss them more than you missed your left eye? I don't think so. I think Jesus' words are clear. It matters not how close, how dear, how precious to you. If it is an occasion for sin, Jesus says, under the threat of hell, cut it out. So the willingness to examine ourselves. And then lastly, on the back page of your notes, Number three, God takes seriously both sin and the Christian's earnest battle against sin. So let me point out something in the passage that's very obvious, but perhaps it would be helpful to point it out. And that's what Jesus did not say. Let me point out what Jesus did not say. If your your hand causes you to sin, pray about it. That's not what He said. If your eye causes you to sin, give it to God. Neither did he say, if your foot causes you to sin, have somebody else cut it off. He said, you cut it off. He said, you gouge it out. He said, you 
take the hand, take the foot, take the eye, and you get it out. Now, we believe deeply in the grace of God. We believe deeply in the powerlessness of the sinner without the Spirit. We believe that Christ is on His way to Jerusalem on which He will hang on a cross to enable the forgiveness of His people so that the Spirit might be given. So being filled with the Spirit, we might not only believe, but we would be under conviction of sin and under the power of the Spirit to kill sin. But here's something that we must all understand very carefully about what Jesus says. Jesus will not get to Jerusalem and go on to a cross on Golgotha and do anything on that cross that negates the necessity of what He just said. Jesus isn't going to get to Jerusalem and die on the cross and while hanging on the cross cry out to the Father, it is finished! And now that it's finished, guys, forget that's that really hard stuff I said on the way here. That was Old Testament people. You're New Testament people now. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus will do nothing on the cross that will negate the necessity of what He said. The giving of the Spirit will in no way negate the need for human effort because that's not how the grace of the Spirit works. The grace of God that is given to the, to the, to the believer in no way undermines or eliminates the need of the believer to endure, to pursue holiness, to strive for the narrow gate, to examine their life carefully and whatever occasions of sin are in your life to cut them out. That's not how the grace of God works. The Spirit doesn't come to you and say to you, look, you've got this really sinful pattern in your life. Just sit back. I'll take care of this. I got this one. That's not how the Spirit works. The Spirit never does His work to the exclusion of the effort of the believer. Here's what the grace of God does. The grace of God does two things in the believer. Number one, it motivates the believer's effort. And number two, it makes the believer's effort effective. It never replaces it. It motivates it. It makes it effective, but it does not replace it. Look in 1 Corinthians 15. Here we see the motivation of the Spirit. Paul says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. You see how plainly Paul is saying, the grace of God is what motivated me to work harder than anyone else. So the the grace of God motivates the believer. Secondly, the grace of the Lord causes our battle against sin to be effectual. Look with me at Titus verse two, or chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, which God, I'm sorry, the grace of God has appeared, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. You see how Paul put it together. The grace of God has appeared and the grace of God working in us is what trains us, equips us, enables us to be effectual in our battle with sin. As Romans 8 verse 1 says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But then Paul goes on to say, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, and by the Spirit are killing that sin that remains in us. And so there's no contradiction. There's a tension. There is a tension between the security of the believer who rests in salvation that is purchased for us by another, and we are secure and safe in that salvation, yet the Savior Himself will say to us, Strive to enter by the narrow gate. And you will take my warnings glibly to your own eternal peril. You will take my warnings of removing the gangrene of sin. You will take those with a grain of salt to your own eternal danger. 